Um, I, I will uh, give this keynote uh, very much on the perspective of landscape and then I will uh, twist uh, towards cities um, to talk really about um, the climate questions we have today, uh, how to make our uh, cities and our open spaces in cities more climate resilient. Um, you might use uh, different words. I call it blue-green infrastructure. You can also call it sponge city. Um, there are different names around the globe, um, and it's basically uh, to find out how can we create uh, also in our landscape engineering better nature-based solutions. And I have a number of cases, uh, and we'll do, I think we will do fine. We have one hour. So I'm, I'm really going through a lot of different uh, cases around the world, different scales. And um, so we, you will get basically also, I think, a, 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 a common basic understanding about what kind of technologies, what kind of approach we have to take uh, to make really an impact. And I think we need to do so much more um, especially for the next uh, decade and the next 10 to 20 years in our cities and landscape architects have a key position in that and we have just to be much more aware about it. Um, first of all, I also have to apologize. I have another meeting actually going on, on at nine o'clock, so I have to um, probably need to step out in, in the second session, but um, I'm hoping to maybe get a, a uh, a video from, from the second presentation, if possible. Okay, let me just start a bit to talk where I live. Um, Peter and I, we have two wonderful lakes, um, the Lake of uh, uh, Zurich and my lake is here, the Lake of Konstanz. Uh, we have This lake is um, actually drinking water supply for four million people. Very, very sensitive and we have to take care. And I think this is all around the world uh, when we when we work with landscapes and we work with catchment areas, here we have the catchment areas from the Alps, it's most uh, fragile, it's most sensitive to uh, the basic needs what we as humans have in, in good water quality. But it's even more, I think if we look at landscapes and if we look at uh, landscape structures um, from a natural um, system, uh, we can find that water plays a very, very important role. Well, water is basically, a if you want to say, you can say it's almost a landscape architect in the long term uh, without human impact. So if we look at Swiss landscapes, for example, in the Alps, and uh, you can find it in many uh, areas in China, you have uh, extremely interesting structures and they are in a permanent change. They always keep a kind of balance between temperatures. Uh, water is the extreme, um, uh, is, is balancing the extremes. It is uh, always adapting and regeneration uh, of landscape again, and it's always in a very interesting form and artistic in a beautiful scale. Where blue meets green, where vegetation excuse, comes excuse in, me, excuse me, Mr. there is uh, always Just... um, a kind of potential uh, sorry, of retention. Sorry to of interrupt. Vegetation. Uh, Hello? The, the, yeah, sorry. Uh, there is something wrong with the uh, point point. It seems that uh, uh, it's not being played. We, uh, the, we have only one still oh. picture. You only have one picture? Okay. Yeah. The first then one. So we, let me just we go don't back. Have the, we have not the presentation mode, so you would have okay. to switch. I, but I have the presentation no, mode. Okay, I just go back. Let me just go back again. <laughs> Sorry. Um, maybe I just try again. Stop sharing. Now I start sharing again. Very sorry for that. Um, maybe I do it this way. Now my question is coming up again. Do you see my presentation? Well, we still see the uh, the uh, not not yet the present presentation yeah now we see it now it's perfect. yeah now okay. it's good. And see, see you the second page so yeah. yeah. now we th see the the yeah movement <laughs> and change <laughs> okay. all okay. right 
I don't but, know what happened. I, it's exactly the same like I had before, but maybe. I, I didn't know whether you, you still wanted to switch to your presentation or this was your introduction, <laughs> so <laughs> sorry. Okay. <laughs> okay, let's go on. Thank you. So, right. Okay, so let's, so I hope you see now the picture. Perfect. Uh, is, uh, saying where blue meets green, it's yeah. uh, most likely yeah. a sponge, which enough time and, tra uh, and transformation, right? Can you see that? Perfect. Okay. Super. So I, th I think Thank it's you. a very important um, uh, note I have to make here that um, natural structures and landscapes have always this kind of uh, things what we are trying to make in our cities when, when we talk about a sponge city or when we talk about new technologies. Uh, we can learn really a lot from nature. And what I often do with my students, and I hope now this works, I make a little film here. I do often little experiments, um, uh, just studying how a river system is actually over time uh, changing uh, the system and changing the forms. Um, there, is, there is a kind of fluxus uh, of, of, uh, of flow where water never goes straight from one side to the other side on a straight line. It always starts to uh, create actually oxbows. It creates kind of very interesting structures. And I think it is very important that we that we are aware um, that we need a kind of different approach when we talk with when we when we work with water, especially I call it usually uh, we need to kind of change our mindset in a fluid thinking and fluid thinking means that we have to uh, be aware that there's always time and space needed. Uh, of course, this is something we are lacking in our cities and we have to reinvent somehow multifunctional uses of time and space. And that's, I think, a very important part when, when it gets to engineering technologies. I show you another uh, little experiment here I do with my students in Singapore. Uh, where I'm actually starting to make uh, basically at the very ber first beginning before we do design work, uh, we look at river systems and we look how uh, erosion and sedimentation is always taking place, um, how certain flow uh, structures are also uh, in, a, in a way interesting forming and shaping. And when we put color in, we can see that uh, everything what we can find in river systems, like that water is flowing back, that fish is using a very special area. These are, these are things which f we find in nature everywhere. And it, there is a, a kind of a storyline left behind uh, what landscapes are actually can uh, explain to us, uh, because our lifetime as humans is much too short to really understand the process of change. And that's something I think which is extremely important when we talk with um, nature-based solutions, that uh, we, we need to get this kind of fluid thinking approach. Sometimes, you know, I'm always fascinated to, to watch children, um, how they actually enjoy and actually discover um, structures of water. And in, in my engineering approach, I'm often looking at inventors and big guys like Leonardo or others we're always combining um, technology uh, with very good artistic and design approach. And they were always looking behind in a very interesting philosophical way about what landscape is. Because how we think about landscape and how we think about cities, that's the way how we form cities. Well, I would like with the second part now to uh, make an opening to look at uh, landscapes from a critical point. Um, you might remember uh, there was an interesting, and I, uh, Peter, I'm, I'm, uh, I did put this one in because it's so close to our living place. Uh, the first glacier disappeared in the Alps. Uh, that was the glacier Pizzol. And we had a special ceremony on 2019. And it's the start of many, many glaciers which will disappear in our region, in the Alps. And that is dramatic. That's really brutal, I have to say. On the other hand, so our drinking water supply, um, like uh, like uh, glaciers, which give enough water um, in dry period in the summertime is actually shrinking, shrinking, shrinking. On the other hand, we have 
lots of floodings. We had this uh, in Asia, we had it in Europe, we had it in Germany, very um, strong this year. Uh, there is actually something where we see the effect of climate change happening in our landscapes and certainly also in our cities. I don't want to go into all the statistics and details and how, how that is actually changing over the last uh, 20, 30 years, how this is at getting more and more extremes. Um, maybe just to point out on one uh, topic. This is that the average of rain shower or rainfall is probably not changing so much, but a little bit, but not so much. But what is really happening is that we have suddenly extremely rain thunderstorms on one spot. On the other part, there is almost no rain coming down. We have that in our cities so that our infrastructures we created for the last 150 or 100 or 200 years, it's not longer than that. This, in, this infrastructure cannot cope and cannot handle it. Uh, usually infra infrastructures which are on pipes or canals or, or retention facilities underground. So we have to rethink uh, in different ways. And I think uh, cities are key. Cities have always a very, very strong connection to water everywhere in the world. All cities are based on a river, based on a lake, uh, based on very, very important um, uh, capacities of water. And the increasing growing of cities that very soon most of people will live in cities, that makes the cities to a real challenge, how we create better infrastructures in our cities. Well, I think there are a lot of wake up calls. Um, we have wake up calls, for example, that uh, even our Western cities here in Europe uh, cannot cope anymore with this uh, uh, growing uh, things expense uh, things, uh, uh, damage uh, um, uh, things are getting more and more expensive. Copenhagen, for example, was hit three times in a row by a so-called 100-year storm event. And we have to rethink what can happen. And I'm, uh, myself, I have to say, I have seen this several times. For example, I have been in Boston um, in January uh, 2018, where uh, storm water and sea level rise came together and all the coast streets were completely flooded. It was also cold, it was snowstorms, uh, cars were frozen in, in, uh, in ice. You probably remember these photos. No one did believe that this would, could happen and it happens more and more. The other extreme we have is uh, droughts and heat waves. And we can see this all around the world that uh, extreme dry and hot days and nights are increasing also in our region, South Germany, Switzerland, and certainly in Asia. In America, for example, we had just uh, the last couple of years extreme droughts and we can see this all around the world. And this is actually affecting, of course, health in our cities. So um, the crisis of the uh, 21st century are, is, is water. It's based on the water question. And here comes actually the point what is for this conference very relevant. When do we invest? When do we start to bring action in? And I would just like to show here one thing. Um, actually, I have uh, brought my, my first company called Atelier Drysidle into a big uh, engineering firm called Ramble, they are based in Copenhagen. So I did work for a couple of years uh, with this company and also with the city of Copenhagen to uh, make financial analysis. What would happen if we don't invest now? What would be the, um, the costs of flood management and the damage, uh, what insurance companies have to pay in the future? And we made a very, very uh, complex calculation with the city. And we figured out if we are doing nothing, it will be extremely expensive, not, not even for next generations, but starting already in our generation, we cannot repair it. But if we invest now where we still have a chance, for example, in certain areas, and certainly in China, we have that opportunities. If we do it better, we can reduce the following costs. So the costs of doing nothing are extremely expensive and we cannot afford about this. So. Let's, let me come to the point, um, 
how to bring base, uh, nature-based solutions in our gray cities, how to bring um, this kind of what I showed in the beginning about well, how nature actually is working, how can we bring that into our dense cities? That's the challenge. And I would just like to say that um, if we compare nature to agriculture and to urban structures, there is a different water regime, usually in, uh, um, in, in the natural landscapes where we have vegetation, most of the water is actually evaporating. Very little is direct rundown, there is infiltration, of course. In cities, it's dramatically different, and I don't want to go into details. We have, of course, all the statistics, we have all the research on that, um, and it shows that as more as you have a hard surface with asphalt, with um, with with uh, thirty percent often of our cities is just for for cars, for basically not even for moving cars, but for standing cars. Uh, this surface is basically um, responsible for that. That water and pollution is running directly in our rivers, and when we need water, we don't have it because it's all gone. So how can we repair that? And how can we actually bring these nature-based solutions back? Nature-based solutions are, in principle, on um, on, two, on on a strategic way uh, to understand. And, and then I think from, with that, you, we can go into the different types of te technology. But we have to understand first the principle. Um, the principle of an, the old approach about engineering is how best to get rid of water as quick and as possible. And um, usually we have created all our basically uh, drain systems. They were started in Great Britain and North Germany and in Paris. And we, we did spread it all around the world. It's basically to get to see rainwater not as a, as a resource, but as a problem. And we get rid of the water um, in pipes. We have all kinds of technologies and a combined or separated sewer system and to get rid of the water and bring it into the rivers and finally into the ocean with all the pollution and everything. Nature-based solutions and soft engineering is, is, uh, has a different kind of philosophical approach and also technology approach. It is using, it is using actually all opportunities to filter, to hold back, to do different things of evaporation, of infiltration, and finally release water in wet and dry seasons, permanent slowly out into the environment. Well, in cities, we have um, different kinds of options for that. And we have to be aware that there, we need a kind of technology toolbox. And uh, the toolbox of blue-green infrastructure is uh, what I call BGI, uh, blue-green infrastructure systems. Um, uh, it's basically um, focusing on two topics. One is how can we handle the quantity of water, which means how can we balance uh, the extreme events where we have too much, or how can we keep water back in dry periods where our streets and green roofs and facades and all different kinds of technologies we need in cities, how can we still feed them with water in these dry periods? So it's a question about um, the, the, the uh, quantity. And the other one is the question about the quality. How can we actually use nature-based solutions to a, uh, to, a, to a point that we say, how can we have cooling effects in cities by evaporation? How can we actually filter? How can we hold water back? And how can we store it and recycle and reuse it? Um, the field of action in cities is basically, um, I would like to put it on three categories. It's actually on rooftops. It's everything which is on the surface, uh, on buildings or on facades. And the second level is actually on the street level. Um, and the third one is in the underground. And there are a lot of different ways of how, how to work with that. If I was put it on a building scale, then I would say we have to invent and be much more uh, in future with new ways of technologies we still have to develop that um, green roofs have the function of uh, quantity and quality treatment of water. So we have to filter it, we have to suck it in, we have to evaporate, and we have to find different ways of uh, working with this 
kind of things. And um, actually, it can happen also uh, on buildings, on facades. I'm not always a big fan of making everything with a lot of lush green in uh, regions where we don't have so much uh, um, um, climate conditions. You know, and in, for example, in Italy, there are um, this um, Bosco, um, uh, the, the, the big buildings we have in Milan, for example, this vertical green. Um, it needs a lot of money, it needs a lot of maintenance, it can be done simpler. But in areas where it can be done, like in Singapore, um, there is certainly a, a place where we can do it. And I think in Europe, we have also to find step by step uh, new ways of using this technology. The second level is actually on the, on the street level. And here we have to use any opportunity, and I will talk more about this, uh, of green parks, of swales, of bioswales, of retention facilities in parks and so on. Uh, and in the underground, of course, we can also do a lot. Uh, in the underground regions, we can store it. We can have uh, uh, storage tanks. We have, we have uh, cisterns. We could have recycling facilities. And I will also show some examples on that. And we can actually filter the water before it goes into there, and then we can use it. Well, all these three levels of uh, rooftops or, or on buildings, on the, on the surface of streets and in the underground is always a conflict about um, different um, needs in cities and it's a conflict, of course, of space. And I think we have to find ways in our technologies in landscape that we see always that we need things to a certain moment in a certain time and in other times we don't need it. So we need to find sharing of space. We need to find multifunctional use. What can happen if we um, keep maybe a place dry for a soccer field or for um, a playground for children? And on the other hand, when we need suddenly this space for water, we uh, let it flood and we, let, we bring water in and then um, it, it goes out and when it's sunshine and dry, kids will come back again and, and play. That is an approach where maybe 10 or 20 years ago when I had such ideas, um, I started 40 years uh, backward from now, I started 1980 with these ideas. Everyone was saying, Herbert, you are totally crazy. Uh, now it's basically a common trend, and I'm very proud that we see that this is really more and more in the young generation taking up. Well, the point is that we need to find also ways how to design uh, our our open spaces and parks in a, in a better way, so we that we allow these multifunctional uses. And it's of course on a small scale on each place where we can do it, but all these things have to be connected. To make a real impact in cities means that we have to find strategic plans to change the whole city to be a sponge city. So to create, I, I think, opportunities where uh, we find any little stepping stone in the city or every green place, every rooftop, every uh, swale, every park has to have these functions of being more water wise being more um, resilient uh, with the question about how to handle stormwater, how to hold it back, how to filter. I have been working in many cities in the last uh, 30 years with um, my team, with different teams and uh, fantastic people. And we always came up with strategic plans. Uh, for example, for Singapore, we call it the ABC Water Guidelines. Um, basically holding the water even back and recycling the water. And I will show one first example, which you probably all know, Bijan Amokya Park, and then later I also will show some new projects. Um, on this one, it was basically the, one of the first pilot projects in this city, and now we have more than 100 such projects. Bijan Amokya Park was basically um, uh, in the city, um, a kind of park isolated from the Kalang River, which was basically a monsoon drain uh, a canal, which was empty. And when it started to rain, it was filling up. It has nothing to do, had nothing to do with the park. It was a fence on both sides. Uh, people were not allowed to go to the water. Water was seen with signs, take care, stay away, 
It was dangerous. It was something like another world not belonging to us. Um, in a very long process of convincing basically all the stakeholders, the municipality, and uh, we, we were starting uh, to open it up. Uh, to change it, to make um, between blue and green a kind of uh, connection and language. We daylighted streams, forgotten streams, side streams. We opened all the concrete. We recycled the concrete. Of course, we had to create also different scales uh, of this of this uh, canal was was actually usually uh, in a very narrow uh, corridor. We had to make it wider. And we said, if we do it wider, it is not just the, uh, a stream, it is also a landscape. It is a breezing stream in a breezing landscape. So when water needs more space, it can spread out. When the landscape needs more space and people want to use it, they can spread out and the water needs to go in. So there's a kind of, um, a kind of change process, which is, I think, important. Well, of course, uh, there are lots of things uh, in the construction. Um, you have to uh, be aware about this. If we do something like this, you cannot be naive. You have to think about how fast is water flowing. We need we made uh, flow simulations. We looked at um, erosion problems. We need we looked at different ways of stabilizing the, the the underground recycling, for example, the concrete, putting it in. And step by step, we made a kind of change in the system. And we had to work, and that's actually what very often we have when we do recycling or reworking on rivers. We have to work while the river is still also working. So it can happen that suddenly your construction site is completely flooded after a, a, a night of rain. And then you have to start again, or you have to organize it. Well, I would like to point out something here, uh, which is uh, when we talk about nature-based solutions, um, we need to find ways to treat also uh, and to teach um, construction companies. Because very often construction companies, especially when you work with landscape, they are used uh, to know, they are used basically how to use concrete, how to use hard material. Maybe they know a bit how to put a plant in and a, and a tree. But how to work with um, bioengineering construction technologies uh, to stabilize riverbeds, how to work with machines and so on, they have very little idea. So you need to train them and you need to prepare it. We did this actually here with Peter Geis from um, South Germany, from near Stuttgart, a good friend of mine. And uh, we used um, not just only our construction drawings, but <laughs> we basically started to give uh, the people a very clear idea how to do it. And that is needed that then you really can manage uh, a big construction site. Um, you have to train even uh, the foremans and the people who are who are running uh, the whole thing. That's a very important part. And if you have done your work right, then also something like Bishan Amokya Park can, can happen. Um, here is just a picture of two scenarios. One is the normal condition on the upper part, and the other one is just after a strong rain event. So um, instead of having retention basins in concrete, we use basically here the park to hold the water back. And uh, when there is a big rainfall and big rain event, and we had it actually even just um, when we made the, the construction, we already had a uh, 50, I think a 25 years storm event. Uh, it, it flooded uh, the valley and later uh, it was no problem when it was going down, people were using the space. Uh, if you bring um, nature-based solutions in, you have a lot to talk about safety and you have to think about safety. You know, a lot of people would think this is dangerous, but actually in my experience, it's not. If people can see very clear when there's water coming and slowly rising that you can step out and, and give the space to water, people will behave in this way. I mean, in Singapore, we have neighborhoods with um, basically millions of people around. Um, they use the park. We have every year we have uh, about six million people visiting the park. So safety is a very big issue, a very big topic. And we had to create kind of um, uh, 
features for for safety we, we made warning signs we made signs how high would the water come up if there is a 50 or 100 year storm event uh, we have uh, loudspeakers in different languages uh, mandarin and of course english and different other languages that people are that people know water might come up please uh, uh, avoid uh, the area of the river go out and when it's sunshine and nice then people can use it so uh, to bring people close to the water is not a thing that it is uh, danger or it is dangerous you have just to find ways that people know how to behave right and i think there's a very big topic about uh, safety um, safety is something we we can never give a guarantee of safety you can also not give it on streets or on a on a, a red line right you always have to find out the way how you behave with this technology and how to create it safe by the way you see uh, crossing areas like the bridge here we made had a very special design uh, to make it very, very light. And I would just like to uh, mention this because very often in, uh, in Singapore or in China, we over-design things, uh, make it too heavy. And I'm, I'm a big fan and big friend of some, something to, to have to make engineering intelligent and use um, also computer technologies to find out what's the right dimension. And you can really bring it down and make it very elegant. For example, these bridges were designed in, first in our studio and then um, we, we we brought it to engineers from Stuttgart and then we brought it to Singapore. Yeah, now let's let's maybe go to a next um, to a next point. I hope this comes here. Yeah, this is um, people, how to involve people in these nature based solutions. Uh, I think it's important that um, we bring people to a close proximity and to an understanding about what um, what environmental topics in our cities are, like how important is water, uh, what, uh, can we see fish, can we see dragonflies, can we see little frogs, can we see that things are not uh, something where we have to be afraid for, but we have to ha learn how to, how to work and how to handle it. And it's very important also to have children to grow up um, in a way that they learn. And, you know, um, especially in China, I would like to mention this because when you look back in older generations, um, our grandparents, our grand grandparents, uh, especially in China's cities, we have been living so much outside. We had such a strong contact. I know this from all my students and my visits in China, um, that people were really kind of the, the whole culture of the day was connected to the environment. And today now we have such um, anonymous cities uh, where we are mostly inside. We have, of course, air condition and children actually know maybe dragonflies and frogs only from television. They have no idea what it is. And so they are afraid about nature and they are not seeing that we need a kind to find a partnership and relationship to the environment. And I think it's important that this this part of of connecting people back to what nature is in our, even in our modern cities is important. And something which is actually a wake up call in many cities. Um, I have been working a lot in American cities like uh, San Francisco, Boston, uh, New York City and so on, Chicago. Even there, they're starting to bring um, opportunities for people to experience water much more close. Now, I would like to talk about something about the filtration and cleansing. Uh, I think this is a very big topic. We can use uh, filtration technologies to use basically different types of soils. I cannot go into all the details now in a short time, but to use special substrate to filter and uh, to get rid of um, particles, but also of uh, nitrates and phosphorus. So uh, filtration uh, is a fact for nature-based solutions we find everywhere and we have to implement it somehow. Here in Vision of Mokyo Park, we actually created it for a kind of cleansing biotope for, uh, for a lake system where we wanted to have the lake water much better and a better quality. Um, you see this can also be designed like a sand garden. Um, there are restaurants around. You see the lake on the other side. People do all kinds of 
sport of Tai Chi in the morning, which I think is very um, common in, in Asia. Uh, luckily, you have that, uh, that older people also do a lot of movement in the morning. And I think this can be close to, uh, to very good uh, design solutions of parks. Even for kids, uh, opportunities to experience water. This is also in Bijan Amokyo Park still. Um, to experience even uh, water, put yourself with your body in, in a water playground, S see how you can hold water back. And actually you can learn even here retention and detention to do, to do it in a playful way, even with your body. Something we like to do or like to find out as engineers with lots of calculations. We can, the, the basic thing are, is, is, is even so that you can show it on a playground. Well, it's also important to involve people more in maintenance, I think in future. And this is actually what we do here. Uh, we give also guided tours and a lot of other cities actually around uh, were using uh, the model of Bijan Amokyo Park and now of others um, to copy it and, and actually to bring it forward. And I think pilot projects are extremely important. Now, what is happening, and I, I finished the proje project here, is um, this one, uh, is that we get a lot of um, biodiversity back in our cities. Here we have um, rare dragonflies coming back, uh, which were on the distinct list. They came back to Singapore on Bishan Amokyo Park. We have fish otters. We have an extre extremely interesting variety now of fish population coming back. Um, the river is really a part of uh, the park and not anymore uh, an ugly drain canal. Now, next step. Uh, of course, there are many ways how to bring now um, technologies into buildings. And I think there are a number of very interesting new uh, examples. I will just show one here. This is in Singapore. Um, uh, we, uh, our team did this together with, the, um, with our architectural partners, uh, Boha from Singapore. Um, it's, an, it's a building which is basically a, a train station, a MRT station, a hawker center. It's a place for old people and it's a place for uh, children. Uh, and on the rooftop, we have a whole landscape. Uh, it's basically like a, like a little forest. Um, and the whole surface is basically evaporating, filtering, doing something to the water. And it's not a gray surface. It's not just a simple green roof, but it's a whole landscape which is creating also part of this building. I think it's interesting that <coughs> with, this, uh, with this example um, that um, uh, in, in future we might think different um, with the separation of nature and buildings. I think it can actually be much more with the technology we have today that it can be interwoven, that we can actually bring it together here is even a hawker center and uh, car parking below um, uh, the tr uh, tram station. And of course, it's also a kind of treatment train for the entire water regime, which we also recycle here. Um, and green facades and, and um, eatable gardens, all these topics uh, belong to this whole question about how to handle landscapes in cities and how to make them uh, more resilient and more uh, water wise. Big experiments at the moment are going on, I think, in different parts of the world. And I just like to mention here the one, uh, the Hotel Oasis in Singapore, also by done by Boha, where they create a kind of structure um, on on this um, uh, hotel. And you just see the contrast. This is uh, on the right hand side, the old fashioned way. Uh, concrete, glass, steel, and on the other hand, you have uh, just a structure where vegetation can come in. There's a very high rate of biodiversity and it's a fantastic atmosphere in this hotel, a very, very um, trendy hotel. Now, um, i like to use uh, maybe the last uh, 15 minutes, a bit more or 20 minutes uh, on different projects just to run through some projects uh, where I basically made um, my experience about what can we do, how far can we go, what can we learn also from, mistake, from mistakes um, uh, and how can we make sponge cities more, um, more on a larger level, also in the industry. 
Here in Berlin, we had, uh, when East and West Berlin came together, we had the chance to work on this area. Um, it's actually um, very close to the uh, Tiergarten, which is the central park in Berlin. And we have an interesting river system there, which is the Landwehrkanal and the Spree. And the Landwehrkanal is basically a side stream. Uh, before bringing all the water in here, we actually had the idea to also recycle the water. And um, I, had, I did this project with Renzo Piano uh, and, and our team here. Uh, we were working on basically catchment areas where we store the water in, in big cisterns, where we recycle the water also for toilet flashing and for greenery and for shopping malls. Um, it's, uh, all the cisterns are basically in the basement where we anyway had to, to build uh, car parking garages and the open water systems can actually uh, go up and down from the water level so we have a lot of retention volume. Of course we need to circulate this, we need to pump it, we have circulation systems where we actually treat every cistern and everything is like a network and we can actually bring water from A to B. Uh, there's a whole technology involved in that uh, where we but but all uh, the systems, even when we pump water from A to B, we use nature-based solutions always in between with cleansing biotopes. The water in itself, even the open waters, are like reservoirs. And to keep them in good shape and good quality, uh, we had to do actually flow, numeric flow simulations. So we studied what would happen if uh, the water goes in on one side uh, how fast uh, and how, mu how much time would it take that every drop is uh, recirculated at least once in two days. So we did optimize the form, we did optimize the inlet and the outlet, and finally then created a lake, uh, which is a lake system which is using nature-based solutions on the right spot. I think that's important. So um, to work with um, technology with beam to work with uh, with with ways how to design um, such systems in the right proportion uh, here you you can actually really have you can really work very very efficient when we when you use uh, simulations when you use for example flow simulations of numeric <clears throat> flow simulations or where you calculate exactly how much uh, space do you have here and how can you optimize it? This was an interesting project for us. It was a big experiment. It has never been done in the world in this scale. And of course, it's also now uh, uh, looking very good, but demand is always changing. So even, even our central park, the Marlene Dietrichplatz will change very soon because levels are changing and uh, buildings have now different functions and so on. So it's, uh, it's a, a permanent, a city is in a permanent process of, of, re, of being redesigned. But basically the um, sustainable design achievements in this project are really uh, stunning, are really great. And I, I, I was really also surprised how much uh, we can reduce the carbon emission, how much uh, we can reduce the uh, fresh water consumption and so on. Even energy questions are very interesting on this. And there's we were always hoping to do more research on that, but uh, <laughs> it was interesting that uh, actually the investors said we are more interested in cars and if this functions, we are happy, but we don't always want to invest. And the German government said, why should we invest so much money in research where you have this wonderful companies like uh, Daimler Chrysler, they have enough money, but they were, so it was, it was a very crazy situation here. Well, talking about cars, I'd like to show one uh, example of an industrial site. This is actually um, Paragon from uh, the car company uh, uh, McLaren. Formula One cars are produced here. This is basically their design and research center. And you see here also basically uh, beside the factory, you see a landscape structure. The landscape basically here, uh, it's a bit southwest of London. Um, has um, is is agriculture, and they were only allowed to make this factory when you cannot see uh, the factory from far. 
and when you work and treat the water and the environment in a very, very optimum way. So every drop here is recycled, is reused, even the runoff of car parks, we bring it into a, um, a lagoon or a former lake, we treat the water, we circulate it, <coughs> we have even a, a formal a lake in front of the building where you see the Formula One cars behind here. Um, the whole system is uh, basically with uh, two lake systems. One is in the center, uh, the clean water, and uh, the outer part is basically the water which will be filtrated and is using also nature-based solutions here. Uh, but on top of that, we are using the rainwater for the cooling system in the building. So the entire plant, the entire factory is cooled by the rainwater recycling. And that's very interesting because we, we bring it basically out, we bring it in, have our heat exchanger, bring it out, and we bring it out over a cascade. So instead of having a cooling tower, we use a very big cascading uh, structure where the water is actually gliding over and by the exchange uh, between air and this gliding water over these uh, stones, uh, there is a temperature drop and this temperature drop is enough to cool the entire plant, which is a, a very, very interesting success and uh, interesting project. So this is actually the construction. Um, tiles we designed in my studio, uh, produced in France and mounted here in Great Britain. I think that's what's a good time work of collaboration. Um, and you see here uh, how it looks today from inside from the factory. So what I want to show with this project is that you can do more when you uh, work with um, stormwater treatment and rainwater treatment, we can actually recycle it. Of course, we have to filter it and everything, but we can actually be more wise and more careful with recycling and using water. And I think there are lots of different ways how to do it. Uh, a smaller project in a city, now I go more to towards city scales, um, here a, an, an, a project in Portland, Oregon. Um, this is basically it was an industrial site. We made workshops with uh, stakeholder involvement, which is also the neighbors and the people who are living there. We had about 300 people working on public in events and workshops. That's another topic I would like to maybe talk another time how to involve people. Uh, but what we do here is basically we collect water from uh, different sites, uh, bring it into the park, filter the water. Uh, some of that water is also recycled, is brought back. We filter it again. Some of that is then going out clean and is going finally clean into the, into the river. There is also art involved in the project. Um, we used uh, recycled the old train tracks. And today this park is really multifunctional. It is uh, nature and people, and it brings biodiversity back. It is, but it is also something where people can enjoy this place. And that's something I think we have to do much more in our cities and even in large scale. Um, here are some suburbs or some new towns uh, where um, a sponge idea, a sponge city idea is implemented right from the beginning. This was an old army base near Stuttgart. And uh, you see the new construction is basically working with every drop of water is treated on site, kept on the surface, brought into a kind of system where we finally bring then the water clean into the environment, feeding new streams, uh, creating uh, kind of new uh, springs and wells. And we filter the water and bring it so clean that it finally actually goes into a, a river and stream system without pollution. Um, actually, what is interesting here is that um, you, you can use different types of filtration. You have, of course, bioswales, which are very common, but you can also make uh, layers of, um, of, of like a park where um, through a first 20, cent 30 centimeter layer, water is actually filtrated by a very special substrate. And then you have a drain system below, which can actually hold water back. It can fill up. Can, it can be empty 
and you basically have a buffer below where you have clean water and you release and leave and and bring this water out so you have like a retention part uh, on top and below and both can work together and if you have a stream storm event um, then of course you can hold it back we had one such a such a a uh, big storm event in Stuttgart where lots of places were flooded. In this area, we had no problem because we could do our homework in front here. And all these technologies, I think, needs really um, space. And we have to design our landscapes in a way that we create um, park systems or modern parks which can have that multifunctional use. So that uh, rainwater harvesting, when rainy weather is, could also be when there's sunny weather and sunshine, a children playground, I mentioned this. And we have to, of, of course, work together with architects, um, uh, with engineers to create interesting features. For example, here, the school is collecting water and has, uh, is basically having a little water fall here when it rains with the architect Lederer also here in Scharnhauser Park. Uh, and then we create, of course, uh, corridors for the water to flow. Maybe I, I uh, uh, skip this project. I just go quick over that one. And go now. I would like now to share at the end some of the uh, projects which are more going towards um, industry and industrial landscapes. Here, I think I would like to mention in this keynote that. Uh, in many, many cities, uh, the challenge is how can we actually redesign the cities? How can we renew, uh, renewal? How can we bring basically um, brownfields to, uh, to a new kind of design approach? And it's often industrial sites or it's also older uh, industrial areas or city areas. And the big challenge is how to make them uh, more um, resilient and more sustainable. Uh, here's one part near Frankfurt uh, in the Offenbach, um, an old harbor. Uh, when, when I started to work on this with our team on this project, then um, it was really kind of people had not really clear idea what to do. And uh, there was already another team working on it and we came in and we said, oh no, <laughs> we should really come up with better ideas. We should recycle uh, a lot of the material. We should actually even reuse the old structure of a crane and all that. We should show that. We should not take it away. It's like uh, a memory of this place. But we should also design it in a way that every uh, water regime in, in the city is uh, basically going through a treatment train. And we should design also the park and even the plaza that the water topic is actually everywhere. So it's like a peninsula, like an island, and you can actually see it in, on, on the picture on the right upper side, on the right hand side. I just try to get my cursor there. I don't know if that works. Oh no, it's, I have lost my cursor. Okay, then um, on, on, on this side you can actually, sorry, I just have to go back. You can see that there is a structure in the surface which is uh, showing wave structures. And so when you cross from the city center to this peninsula, you see you're actually going over an old historic uh, canal. And the canal is actually shown in the structure of the landscape. So <coughs> I think there's lots of opportunities um, to, to create uh, things so that you feel even in the design, it is related to water. Well, what is special here is that we started with the infrastructure, blue-green infrastructure, the filtration, um, the facilities to hold water back and to slow it down and to filter it. We did this first, and then we started to bring in the buildings. So uh, the landscape was done first, and then the buildings came in actually later. And I think that's a, a very important part. Um, when you work as landscape architects and as um, designers of open spaces, um, we are coming often too late. We are asked too late. So a very important part in education and in um, working in, with uh, clients and 
in municipalities is that we have to make our voice uh, stronger heard. And uh, people have to notice us that we have to be implemented right in the beginning in the planning process. Because if we bring uh, blue green infrastructure and park structures in too late, then we have no chance. We have to create actually blue green infrastructures in the very first beginning, like usually engineers come in and create uh, streets and and um, and and uh, for cars corridors where they can drive. Um, that's taken for granted. Green is usually seen as a kind of decoration when there is some money left over to make it nice at the end. That is completely wrong. That's actually I have to say. Sorry to say that, but it's totally bullshit because um, the landscape should be really one of the first things to come in. And that's, I think, extremely important. Now, landscapes are also the landscapes which are often the destroyed landscapes. How can we create actually plans and master plans and structures to make destroyed landscapes more to healing landscapes back again? I give one example where I'm still working on uh, with a team from Sweden. We are working for Gatzweiler 2, that's uh, uh, a big mining area in Germany, which is now in a very interesting position because we have a new, new government. And so I think uh, the process I will show you here will be even faster than we were uh, thinking. We did win this competition on this project. So, uh, and it's basically a kind of strategic plan how to bring uh, the blue-green infrastructure and how to transform the in industrial um, landscape to a more uh, to a better human human uh, usable uh, landscape um, with with basically also with the lake with a water regime. So I think for this this comes back to the very first what I said at the, at the beginning. We need to think about timing. We need to think think about how are the process over time and how will, for example, the filling up of this lake look like in different scenarios. So um, the, there will be uh, smaller towns, smaller villages around with new functions. There will be a kind of new landscape with green corridors, with forests uh, coming in. There will be like a, like a, a water uh, structure left over because that's basically the volume we took out of the mining and we have to find basic um, uh, pictures of imagination, how would that look at different times? For example, if you see on the uh, right hand side, the two little sketches, ideas about having like a research lab, which is floating then later on water and going up step by step when the lake is filling up because this will take quite a while. I will come to the end uh, with my keynote because I know we have maybe five minutes left over here. Um, I would like just to show a bit at the end also some current projects. Um, this one is for uh, Basel, Volta Nord, uh, a very interesting area, which is basically uh, was the chemistry um, and uh, big companies uh, like Sandoz, um, like Bayer and others had basically their first research and headquarters in this triangle. This area is now, um, the industry is actually moving away and this is now a, a new a city. The city will spread out in this area. Uh, they will recycle some, some buildings, but a lot of that will also be done new. There is a lot of infrastructure, train corridors, highways and so on. And here we try also to work um, in this way, uh, very sensitive and very careful how to handle uh, water, how to use it better. So we create actually all the toolboxes, what I have shown you at the beginning, um, rooftops, bioswales, infiltration ways, uh, areas where we can actually hold it back and delete uh, the water slowly. This whole project here in Basel um, is um, built on, a, on, on the principles and we made also the hydraulic calculations for that to um, hold every drop of rainwater on site. There's nothing of the rainwater is going into the canal. So the, the, the uh, sewage pipe is only taking sewer water, but no rainwater. 
the rainwater is completely treated on site. There is uh, a very good way of infiltrating the water into the grounds. So uh, we have different parts where we hold the water back, where we infiltrate it, where we work with different um, areas. And each area is exactly um, worked on and calculated how much water do we need, how much do we need to hold back, how quick is it infiltrating in which area. And that's how you actually create a kind of system which then works together. And you have to coordinate it then with the architects and allow so and so high or so and so big uh, it can be the rooftop. This is the kind of technology we want to use. And then we bring the water in in certain areas and it has to be um, a coordinated action in the city planning. And that's what uh, this, the municipality of Basel is doing for a number of uh, new places. We even redesign the streets. We make the streets a bit smaller. We uh, basically bring also more swales and green in. Uh, we also work on some um, areas of new parks like the Luzbüchelplatz, uh, where we use the park as a kind of sponge uh, system. And this, this is actually especially for um, dry periods when we have hot seasons. We want to have still evaporation. We have a we want to have a cooling effect. So uh, here is basically to build a kind of um, swamp garden or, or or tank to hold the water back, and even under a light construction of a building, so that uh, the um, special trees, uh, which are wet uh, land trees, can actually survive and can give also evaporation and the cooling effect uh, to the different places. So I see, see that my time is uh, uh, over. Um, so I will finish with just one uh, summary of that. I think um, when we talk about um, blue-green infrastructure and when we, when we talk about the ways how we can work with more climate resiliency in, in green landscapes, in artificial landscapes in, in cities, we really have to um, think uh, that, our, uh, uh, that our performance and our profession as landscape has to be combined with, with many, many other disciplines. So um, I always call it, we have to integrate and break the silos. Usually silo thinking is that everyone is trained in his silo or in her silo, transportation, food, energy, um, politics and everything is usually always in one specific uh, mindset. And we have to bring that together in a way to bring really the complexity of that more to solutions. So even that needs fluid thinking and we have to overcome, of course, the, the silo thinking. And I think that's something we have to train much more in cities. Singapore is, uh, that was a big topic there. Um, I was actually giving many lectures in this way and Singapore is doing this now in the different municipalities are always coming together to uh, common visions. And this is a very important part that we actually go in the same direction. Uh, and that's again what we can learn from water <laughs> because there's, nev there's never only one solution. There are many ways uh, how we can actually go forward. And I will finish my presentation with the last picture of my wonderful lake, which I love so much. And I just see the sun, uh, no, the light is coming up. It uh, was very dark before. And I will join a little bit your next uh, thing, but then I have to step out for another conference, which is still here going on for my city because I'm also responsible here for the politics. So I wish this conference a uh, very big success. Thank you again for inviting me and I hope I, I have given you some um, inspiration for good discussions and uh, further research also at your university. Thank you so much.